Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Today I want to talk a bit about Space Shuttle history. So over 30 years and over 100 missions, the Space Shuttle showed a lot of different capabilities. It broke ground uh, in you know, space construction and satellite servicing missions. Things like repairing the Hubble Space Telescope simply would not be possible in any other human-rated spacecraft. But there's one mission plan which drove the design of the Space Shuttle more than any other, and in the end, it never flew. During the 1970s, it was known as Shuttle Reference Mission 3B, and there was a closely related Mission 3A. So during early development of the Shuttle program, they actually had you know, hard to get political support, and it came within a single vote of being cancelled. So NASA sort of played the political game, and they made a deal with the Department of Defense. They would redesign the shuttle to accommodate a wish list of requirements, and, well, NASA pretty much paid for this, and in exchange they got support from the DoD. But even before this happened, there had actually been influence of the design uh, from the military. For example, early shuttle designs had a blunt re-entry with very little wings, and the Air Force Flight Dynamics Laboratory said, you know, we would prefer delta wings because those will perform more uh, across a much wider range of airspeeds and give you control all the way down, giving you better cross-range capability. But the actual military requirements for the space shuttle in exchange for the political support, they were much more onerous on the design. So the payload bay became a massive 15 feet long, by, uh, wide by 60 feet long. That's about four and a half meters by 18 meters. Uh, and it, that made it able to carry the new generation of reconnaissance satellites. NASA was fine with this too because, hey, it, it helped them with their goals. It certainly served them well when they were building the International Space Station. However, this large payload bay meant that the orbiter no longer had room for massive fuel tanks and that necessitated the large disposable external tank and, of course, the foam and its various problems. The Delta Wing design actually also required a much more capable heat shield since it would spend more time flying like an aircraft at hypersonic speeds. But anyway, reference mission 3B, that would be the plan that set just how big those wings needed to be, transforming the shuttle orbiter from a winged space capsule to a fully fledged space plane. 3B involved a single orbit rendezvous and capture of a spacecraft in near polar orbit, followed by an immediate landing back at the launch site. So for this, the shuttle would launch from a site at Vandenberg. Uh, payloads to polar orbits generally have to use the West Coast launch site to avoid the risk of dropping spent stages on land. The vehicle would launch southwards in a carefully designed trajectory which would take 12 minutes to reach orbit and finish with the shuttle on an intercept course with a target satellite. Now normally when the shuttles go into orbit, they're initially in a low orbit with the perigee still inside the atmosphere so that they can dump the external tank and that will re-enter and then they can use the ohms, the orbital maneuvering system, to push them into a proper orbit. But this plan had to put them on the same orbit as the target, likely a lot higher up, and that also had to bring the tank up with them to get there fast. In this design, the tank would also include a small solid rocket motor that would be used to deorbit the tank quickly, but this never made it into the shuttle final shuttle design. So normally after reaching orbit, you would then dump the excess propellant in the external tank, and you do this dumping it through the engines and vents and things like that. This usually takes a couple of minutes, but because the time is critical in this mission, they wanted to skip as much of this as possible which meant another modification to the launch design. So the shuttle launch trajectories, they're usually designed to be as efficient as possible to make sure that when you get to orbit, you have as much propellant left over as possible. And that means that you have excess available if there's an emergency. But instead, for this rapid rendezvous, they wanted to minimize the amount of time they spent dumping propellant, so they would adjust the trajectory to maximize the propellant that would be used and make sure they ended up with the minimum amount left in the tank. So it was a less efficient trajectory, but it saved them time overall. So after dropping the tank and moving away, the orbiter opens the payload bay doors and it starts preparing for rendezvous and capture. It would be chasing the target about 10 nautical miles below it and 7 nautical miles be behind it. It would be on an elliptical trajectory, which is designed to intercept the target in about 20 minutes. 
So for the next 20 minutes, the spacecraft is basically taking measurements of the target and making adjustments to its approach. The vehicle maintains an attitude which keeps the target above the payload bay because that's where the rendezvous sensors are pointed. Uh, there would be limited contact with ground control during this operation. So they had to be able to do this uh, performing all the trajectory analysis on board with the onboard computer. Uh, all the maneuvering on approach is performed using the small reaction control thrusters rather than the large orbital maneuvering thrusters. So yeah, initially the approach speed is about 30 meters per second, and while the shape of the orbit will naturally slow the approach to some extent, there's lots of brute force maneuvering to reduce the speed down to about 3 meters per second once they're within 100 meters and less than 32 minutes after liftoff, they would be station keeping within 30 meters of the target. And at that point, they would have about 20 minutes to capture the spacecraft, presumably with the manipulator arm, and then put it into the payload bay to store it, stow it securely for the return to Earth. Now you have to remember the shuttle is an aircraft and getting the center of mass just right is critical to the flight dynamics. So they can't just throw it in there. I don't know how they would actually be able to do this because on all the shuttle missions where they flew that did actually capture something from space, they were way more cautious and took their sweet time in these kind of operations. Also, by the way, if you needed astronauts to help you, I, I presume they would have to be suited up and ready to go and they'd have pre-breathed oxygen before launch. And they maybe run straight to the airlock as soon as possible or maybe they would just like have no airlock doors and have everyone wearing pressure suits point is i don't think evas would be done for this kind of mission it wouldn't make sense with the time they had so anyway after this act of magic making the satellite disappear into the shuttle they would close the payload bay doors and perform the deorbit burn as they crossed the equator going north over africa now the deep orbit burn in this mission it is only supposed to use one of the Ohm's pods, presumably because this is a one orbit mission and they wanted a big safety margin in case one of the Ohm's pods failed. So if you work with the principle of one working, then um, you're guaranteed to be able to do it in time. So at that, they're descending and entry interface occurs over Europe and they begin to perform re-entry over like Greenland, the North Pole. And at this point, they're aiming to touch down at Vandenberg. But because of the rotation of the Earth, the launch site has actually moved eastwards and is about 2,000 kilometers east of their orbit track, which means they have to make this long, slow turn. Well, slow, it's a big, wide, curved turn at hypersonic speeds. And this is the maneuver that sets the cross-range capabilities of the shuttle, and therefore, the small wings that were originally envisaged for the shuttle grew into these large delta wings. So the shuttle would fly down the west coast of the US, dropping sonic booms on towns along the west coast like San Francisco, and then it would touch down uh, and come to a halt about one hour and 50 minutes after taking off. So anyway, Mission 3A used essentially the same flight path, but it was deploying a satellite into orbit. So it didn't need the fast rendezvous or capture or stowing of the satellite. Instead, it was a much easier deployment. Also, during the re-entry, it wouldn't have had the mass of the satellite on board. So the wing size constraint was smaller for the 3A. So 3B set the size of the cargo bay, the performance of the thrusters, the performance of the wings. It was critical to the design of the shuttle as we knew it. Now, if you look at the mission plans for this, you'll notice that the flight path doesn't pass over the Soviet Union or any of their territories. So this mission would be really hard for an adversary to observe. And many people then took a look at this mission and they assumed that this must be some sort of sneaky plan to grab some Soviet satellite from orbit. But I highly doubt that this was the case since they could only reasonably capture and store a satellite in the 20 minute window if it was designed for this and it cooperated. The documents specify a 25,000 pound satellite in a 100 nautical mile orbit with 104 degree inclination for both launch and recovery. So given the low orbit and the identical parameters, I presume that it's a reconnaissance satellite Probably a lot like those in the Corona program, but in, instead of returning the film via re-entry capsules, the entire spacecraft is just captured and returned to the ground. The size and the mass of this payload are pretty close to that of the KH-9 hexagon, 
which flew in 1971, or first flew in 1971. And if you take off the mapping camera, it'll just fit into the shuttle payload bay. So it's possible that they were considering an evolved version of this, which would fly on the space shuttle and get rid of those um, re-entry capsules. Maybe at some point we will find some more declassified documents that will reveal the truth behind this. Anyway, planning for these single orbit missions had apparently stopped by 1977. I think it's probably that the time constraints were just too tight to make the plan feasible. And at the time, they were also seeing the first electro-optical satellites in development. So it might have been a hard sell to pursue a new film-based system at that time. So without the single orbit requirements, the large wings on the space shuttle were no longer needed. But by that time, NASA was committed to the shuttle design we all know and love. Of course, uh, the idea of launching the shuttle from Vandenberg into polar orbits did live on, and they did begin building out a launch facility at Vandenberg. The site was to be Space Launch Complex 6, which had originally been planned for the Titan III carrying the Gemini uh, ma mar uh, manned orbiting laboratory. But that never came to fruition and it never flew. As a shuttle launch facility, it was quite different from what we saw on the East Coast. There was no large vehicle assembly building and a crawler transporter. Instead, the vehicle was assembled inside on a pad inside the service structure and then when they were getting ready for launch, they would roll the structure back and reveal the vehicle. There are actually photos of this facility during fit tests with the Enterprise test vehicle on it. So you can actually get an idea of what it would have looked like. But it was never used because after Challenger disaster, the DoD stopped working on the Vandenberg facility for various other reasons. And it wasn't possible to fly these kind of polar launches needed for reconnaissance from Florida. Now, STS-36 was a classified DoD mission, and that was the one that pushed the shuttle to the highest inclination, higher than any other. And to do this, they had initially to fly out you know, along a normal launch azimuth for safety reasons, and then they dropped the solid rocket boosters and made a left turn going north to get into their target orbit. So that was the end of the story of Shuttle at Vandenberg, but it wasn't the end of the story for Space Launch Complex 6. Uh, they they initially tried to reallocate it to Titan IV, but that quickly was cancelled. Then Lockheed came along with their Athena launch vehicle, and they actually flew four times out of this site. The, the rocket had to sit on a dinky little milk stool, or sorry, a milk stool to raise it up to the servicing height. And currently, Delta IV flies out of there, and I guess that's where it's been most successful, although there is only two flights left. It is kind of cool to look at it. It's still very much recognizable as the original shuttle facility built back in the era when the US envisaged a fleet of space shuttles being able to do everything needed in space. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.